Um, the hope is, though, that you will keep your notes and that they will be good enough for you to study from before your placement test. Jennifer. Um, for the placement test, do you use your notes? I'm going to guess no. Um, also, I believe on the placement test that you won't be able to use a calculator. So a lot of times I kind of show you, like, hey, if you don't have a calculator, you need to do this trick. You're going to want to pay attention to those. Placement, placement test is the test they use to determine that you really are ready for geometry. So most high schools will use, um, will use the placement test to determine if you're good enough to start in geometry or if you should be in Algebra 1. And most of the time that's what they really rely upon, even if you did really well in 8th grade or got a recommendation. I call the school that I most likely will go to, and they say they don't do placement tests. Okay, then they're probably reliant on recommendations, and you don't get a recommendation from me unless you do well in this class. Okay. Any other questions before we start? Alrighty, okay. Um, first thing we're going to start with, with is reciprocals. Let me make sure I'm spelling this right. I know you guys have heard this word before, so what is a reciprocal? Or give me an example if you don't know the definition. Yeah. Well, a reciprocal is kind of like a flipped over version of a fraction. So if you like have one half in the reciprocal, that would be two over one. So it's the flipped over version. Sure, if you want to think about it like that, that's absolutely fine. There is, of course, a mathematical definition. Um, it can also be called the multiplicative inverse. So the main definition is that a number times its reciprocal gives you 1. And we'll take a look at some examples in a second. So what's the reciprocal of a half? Dan? It's 2 over 1. So the reason I can kind of check this and say that, oh, yeah, that is the reciprocal is because if I multiply these together, I get 2 over 2. That's weird, 2. Equals 1. So if you ever want to check, oh, is that really the reciprocal, then it times its reciprocal should give you 1. So what about with negatives? If I have a negative 4 over 3, what would be the reciprocal of that? What do you think? <coughs> positive 3 over 4. If I multiply these, will I get positive 1? So what, what do I need to change about that 3 over 4? So the reciprocal of a negative number still needs to be negative, because then if we're going to multiply them, then we get to that positive 1. So if you need to write yourself a note, the reciprocal of a negative needs to be negative. Would it be okay if I turn out the lights? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, that's way too much. Never mind. It's way too dark outside. All right. I guess it'll be okay. Yes? Wouldn't the one be negative one? Because negatives times negatives equal positive. So that's why you kind of want to remember that so that you can check should it be negative or should it be positive? Because it always seems to get to a positive one. What's up? I have a verbal from his mom. Okay, no problem. He'll have to finish next week. <laughs> 
Okay, sounds good. All right, John, you better grab a piece of paper and start writing fast. All right. Now, what if I'm I have variables? What if I have x over y? What if I have x over y, Joey? The same thing with applying. You can times it by y over x to get one. Oh. Y over x, because that's going to be x over y, x over y, which is one. So even if you have variables, it still applies. Same thing. Yeah. No, if one is negative, the other one has to be negative. But what if it's one negative and positive? That wouldn't. One fraction positive, one negative. You mean, are you talking like if we had a negative three over a positive four sort of thing? And then the other one would be positive. No, the other one has to be also negative because when we multiply these, we want to get to a positive one. Because we want negative times negative. Okay. One more. And it seems like it should be the easiest, but it always trips people up. What's the reciprocal of five? Why is it one over five? Because with whole numbers, you put a one on so for some reason, it always freaks people out. Whole numbers have a 1 underneath it. We don't write it, but it's always there. So when you think about flipping it, you have to think about the fact that there is that 1 that comes up. So this is the multiplicative inverse where we are trying to get to 1. Now let's talk about the additive inverse. Oh, is it okay if I erase some of it? Okay. Yeah. So with the multiplicative inverse, we were essentially saying, what can you multiply it by to get to 1? The additive inverse is, what number can we add it to to get to 0? So let's say I had 1. What do I add to 1 to get to 0? I add negative 1. So these two are additive inverse is. Because you add them together to get to zero. Well, if it's the additive inverse, you add. If it's the multiplicative inverse, you multiply. Yeah. So does that just mean that you change like, positives to negatives and then add and negatives to positives? And Pretty much, yeah. So you don't have to put the addition sign just because it's additive? Inverse. Oh, no, that was, this is just to show that these are additive inverses of each other. If you want to show how it works, you can put that, oh, we're adding together, and this is the proof, essentially, that they are additive inverses of each other. So multiplicative inverse equals 1, and additive inverse equals 0. So let's try another one. If I have negative 5, what is the additive inverse of negative 5? Riley? 5? It's going to be, yeah, just 5. Because I can add them together and that will get me zero. So the additive inverse of negative five is positive five because it adds up to zero. All right. 
Can I erase this? Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> All right. Let's move on to coefficients. Is that how you spell it? Coefish? No, that's not how you spell it. I think that's right. Not that they'll ask you to spell this word. Have any of you heard this word before? Coefficient? Maybe a little bit? So the word and the definition are actually a lot more complicated than the concept itself. So we're talking about the number or the variable that's being multiplied by another variable, and it's normally the one up front. Um, the reason we're talking about this is not so much that you're going to have too many problems exactly with coefficients. I just want to make sure that if this, this word pops up, you're not, you're not like at a loss of what this means. So let's say I had 4x. What, which, which part of that is the coefficient? Is it the 4 or is it the x? What do you think? Four. The 4. The 4 is the coefficient to x. So you'll hear that you heard a lot of... Um, we have a coefficient of 4 being multiplied by x. So if I want to write a term with a coefficient of 3 being multiplied by y, a coefficient of 3 being multiplied by y, what would that look like? 3y. Right. So if you ever hear them just say coefficient, it just means normally it's the, the number before, but it can also be the letter before. So like if you have x, y, x is your coefficient. But normally it refers to the number. What? I know, right? The definition does make it seem so more ominous than it really is. It's just the first whatever. That's why I wanted to bring it up because I knew that that word would throw you off. It would just be, um, what does it mean, to, like, when it says multiplied by variable first? So, x is the coefficient in this term because it's first, um, not y. y is the secondary variable. But you can also have, um, to get a little bit more complicated, like in this term, you can either say that x is the coefficient to yz, or you can say that xy is the coefficient to z. It gets a little weird. But normally you see you see it with with numbers. Okay, that's actually all we're doing with coefficients. Are we good? Yeah. All right. Now let's actually get into some real math. Okay, we're going to talk about how to evaluate expressions when you're given variables. It's something we've actually done, but you've never probably known that this is what it's called.
So you might see a question like this, evaluate x plus y when x equals 5 and y equals 3. Evan? So is the test about algebra? It's about algebra. So it's, it's to make sure that you know enough algebra that you really can not skip algebra 1. Because it's, it shouldn't be about geometry because you're not in geometry yet. So you shouldn't know geometry yet. Wouldn't it be eight? So Haley's saying this is 8. What do we think? Yes. Should it be 8? Yeah. Yeah. Why? What, what's going on? What should I do with these that tells me this is 8? Jennifer? You just plug in the variables. Oh, we just plug in the variables. So it really is that simple. We're going to put in 5 for x, and we're going to put in 3 for y. And then we just evaluate it, which means we just solve it. Okay. Now, obviously, they can make them a lot more complicated than that. <coughs> I should have done my wise with that. You guys think you can do that one? Yeah. Try it out. So x plus y, or sorry, well, xy plus yz plus 2y when x equals 1, y equals 2, and z equals 4. Try it out. Ailey? Okay. Ailey has a answer. Isaac? 14. Isaac's also saying 14. Jack? Yeah. Okay. So let's try it out. So wherever there's an X, I'm going to put a 1. So there's a 1 right there. Let's choose a better color. Wherever there's a y, I'm going to put a 2. So I need here, here, and here. So times 2, we get here. And then wherever, I'm running out of colors. Wherever there's a z, I need to put a 4. So there go 4 there. Plus 2 times our y. Okay. So I don't have any questions about where I got those numbers from. We're good with at least plugging them in. Too many patterns. Okay. All right, then we just go through and solve. 2 times 1, or 1 times 2 is 2. 2 times 4 is 8. 2 times 2 is 4. And then you just add those up, and yep, you get 14. How do we feel about this? Feel okay? Do we need more examples? No? No? We're good? Okay. Alright. Oh, we're doing great on time. Alrighty. Can I erase this? Yeah. Okay. I wish all math classes could be like this. so much better than <laughs> All right. Let's get down some properties that they might throw at you. Additive property of equality. Very big words for a very simple concept.
Yes. We're, we're going to have one more property that I'm going to show you. Yes. All right, what do we think of this property? If A equals B, then A plus C should be equal to B plus C. Isaac? Yeah, it's just saying that if you plug in a new variable, no matter what, if you have two variables that are same, then it's not both sides, it's going to be the same. Right, because if A is the same value, value as B, then it shouldn't matter if I'm adding A or I'm adding B since they equal the same thing. Like, if both A and B are 5, then adding 5 is adding 5, honestly. Okay. Now, where it gets complicated is this is actually kind of the, the property that we're using right now in math for the substitution of when we get Y equals. And because we're saying Y equals all this stuff, that's why we can substitute it in for Y. So that's why that works. Is there any questions about this one, or do, I, do we need to do some examples or anything? All righty. It seems really, really simple, but this is kind of the fundamentals of algebra, is the fact that something can equal something else, so we can substitute them. All right. Let's do one more. This one's very, very similar. Multiplicative property of equality. If A equals B, then it doesn't matter if I'm multiplying C by A or by B, because they're the same thing. So again, these are very, very simple properties, but if they throw these words at you, these names, I don't want you getting thrown off by what they mean. Questions, thoughts, comments on that one? It's not too bad. Okay. All right. I'm actually really excited about this next thing. All right. We good with the oh, stuff that's um, on the board? Yeah, Dan? Okay. All right. Next, I'm going to be showing you guys how to simplify decimals and fractions that are in equations. We actually did a little bit of this in class today. So we're just going to take it a little bit further. <coughs> it's actually really simple. And this is going to be one of the things that you're going to want to be able to do if you don't have a calculator. So this will save you when it comes time for the test. All right, we good? Yeah? OK. So how to simplify equations that have decimals or fractions. So let's start with a simple example. 0.2x equals 0.4. Now most of you could probably actually do this really simply. I have a tendency to really mess up when I do math with decimals, so I like to get rid of them whenever possible. Now in class today I showed you guys that you can change equations as long as you multiply everything by the same thing. So what can I multiply 0.2 by to make it a whole number? 
What would I multiply 0 0.2 by to turn it into a whole number? You want to think about just like moving the decimal point. Joey? 10. Yeah. But let, so let's multiply everything here by 10. And it just moves the decimal everything by one point. Because when you multiply things by 10, it just moves over the decimal one point. Jack? What? You could have done five, um, but that, I mean, it, you definitely, yes, can do five. Um, I just feel like it might get a little bit messier, but you are absolutely willing, uh, you can do five. You could do 100 if you wanted to. If you wanted to do 100, even, multiply everything by 100, not like that, like this. Well, then it's, okay, we have 20x equals 40. It's going to be the same answer, just whatever you're comfortable with solving. So you can manipulate equations to essentially make them numbers that you like. So what, what would you rather solve? Would you rather do 0.4 divided by 0.2? Would you rather do 4 divided by 2? Or would you rather do 40 divided by 20? You get the same answer. It's just about what you want to change it to. I like doing like sets of tens because it's just you're just shifting the decimal number, the decimal place. All right. Yes, ready to try an actual hard example? Yes. Okay. This seems so excited. This is awesome. <coughs> Ten is easiest if you have one decimal place. But what if we don't have one decimal place? You can multiply, yeah, if you have two decimal places, you'll want to multiply 100. You're absolutely right. So let's try. Go ahead and write that down. 0.001x minus 0 0.03 equals 0.4. Those are definitely numbers I cannot do in my head. So what might we want to move all the decimals by? Like how many places would we want to move all the decimals by? Maybe move them all three? That might be the simplest because then all of them are going to be whole numbers. You, of course, are welcome to do less than three. So if I want three, I need to have three zeros. But if you're a little bit more comfortable with decimals, you could just do 10, 100. But if you want even bigger numbers, you can go higher than 1,000. So if I multiply everything by 1,000, they're all going to move three decimals. So it's just going to be 1x, 30, 400. Because personally, I think this second one looks a lot better than this. Yeah. I am more willing to solve this second one than I am the first one. How do you guys feel with this concept? Good. Yeah. Kind of okay? Yeah. Do you have a question? Okay. All right. Now, this works with fractions as well. You can. So if you do have a, um, an equation that has fractions in it, you can turn them to decimals. But some fractions don't turn nicely into decimals, like if it's one-third, right? You're never going to multiply by a number that's going to make it a whole number. Unless you multiplied everything by three. Oh, that's what I could use. Actually, let's make it sure, 10. So 1 half x plus 5 over 3 equals 10.
So Evan's right, you could change this all to decimals, but five thirds doesn't change nicely into decimals. So this is one you want to remember back to what, like fourth grade when you learned about your common denominators. What number can I multiply these by? So I essentially have a common denominator for everything. I, I might want to multiply everything by six because two times three is six. So let's try what that, let's see what that does. Let's see if six is enough. So let's try multiplying everything by six. Because you can always try something and if it doesn't work out, multiply everything again. Do you have a question, Brian? Can't you um, turn 550 to a mixed number and then put it back into a decimal? But it's still going to be 0 0.3333333. 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. That's the problem. All right. So half of six, we got 3x. Six and three, one of the threes cancel out, leaving behind a two. Two times five is 10. And then six times 10 is 60. So that looks a lot simpler to solve than with the fractions. How's the five thirds turn? Okay, so let's go a little bit slower through the five thirds because we're all a little rusty with fractions. So I did five thirds times six. Now, if you're not really good with the whole canceling out, if you're not really good with the whole canceling out, you can just go straight through. That would be 30 over three, which is 10. Or if you're, if you're a little bit good with canceling out, you know, well, 6 can cancel out with 3, but you still have a 2 left over. And then it's 2 times 5 gives you 10. So any of those ways will be fine. Can I erase this? Okay. Let's mix things up a little bit. Right. Now we have fractions and decimals. <coughs> One fourth x minus 0.43 equals two. You have a guess? What do you think? Uh, you would turn the fraction into a decimal, which would be 0.25. So we can turn 1 fourth into 0.25x. <laughs> and then we know how to work with this. What might I want to multiply everything by? Isaac? 100. 100. Okay. So that'd be 25, 43, and 200. So this way, when it comes time for the, the test and you don't have a calculator, these numbers are easier to work with. Oops, that's supposed to be negative. These numbers are easier to work with than the ones prior. All right. I have a little um, just a worksheet for you guys to work through so you can have some more examples and more practice with this. <coughs> this is not homework. Don't feel like you have to get these done. Um, spend, hmm, I'm going to give you six minutes to work through this. Challenge yourself. Try to do the hard ones. And then we'll go over any that you feel like you want to go over. All right, we need to keep going. So what? which ones do we really, really want to go over? Jasmine. Number eight. Eight. Okay, I'm looking at the wrong thing. All right, number eight said, number eight said negative 2.4 equals y over 4. Okay, y over 4 can also be thought as what? What, what fraction is really actually being multiplied by y? Y. One fourth. So if you don't like how this looks, change it. <coughs> okay. Now we already did an example where we had a decimal and a fraction. What should we do with the fraction so it's going to be easier to work with? Joey. Uh, well, you can get rid of the fraction by times 
both sides by 4 over 1. Is that going to be easy with the decimal? Well, basically times both sides by 4, so. Ryan? Turn into a decimal. Turn into a decimal. So, Joey, you are not wrong. You can do whatever you want. I'm just trying to go through the easiest steps. So, if I change this into a decimal, I get to there. So, now what might I want to multiply them by so I end up with nice numbers? By 100. So, if I multiply everything by 100, then we get negative what? Is this going to be 240, 25y? Because we're all better at dividing whole numbers than fractions and decimals and all that. Dan? Why is it 0.25y? Um, because we changed it from 1 fourth to 0.25. Uh. Is there another one on that sheet we want to go over? Sophia? Number five. Number five. Oh, that is not erasing well. <laughs> All right, sorry, which one I got distracted? What number, Sophia? Five. K. Oh, this is kind of the same thing. K over four equals a negative 2.2. Evan, you're going to be here. You're going to behave. All right, so this is kind of the same thing where we're getting scared just because we have a variable <coughs> over 4. But what fraction is multiplying by that variable? 1 fourth. So we can rethink it as 1 fourth times k equals a negative 2.2. Yes, 7. So now, once again, we can change the, the fraction of a fourth to 0.25 times k. Once we're there, we can make the choice to multiply everything by 100. So we get 25k equals a negative 220. Yeah, you can, you can absolutely multiply everything by 10. So if we multiplied everything by 10 instead, so if we did 10 times our 0.25k equals a negative 2.2, and if you just want to do that, so you get 2.5k equals a negative 22, if you're happy with that, work with this. So like I was telling some tables is this is not something you're actually going to be evaluated on, but this is something that can save you from solving something like this when you're not ready to, especially if you don't have a calculator. So you can manipulate it however you want to get it to numbers that you can work with and you can do in your head without a calculator. All right. Is there any others on there that we want to go over? Okay. All right, I want to teach you one more thing, kind of similar skill, and then we'll move on. Oh, my God, my board. So in the same way that we can multiply everything by something, we can also divide everything by something. So this is still pretty much the same thing. It's just, it's still multiplying an, 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 ex, an um, sorry, oh, equation. Like the yeah, it's just like the opposite. So instead of multiplying everything by something, we essentially divide everything by something. So this is still simplifying equations. So some of you can look at this and you're, you're totally okay with doing this. Some of you might look at those and be like, there's probably an easier way to get rid of all those zeros before I have to go through the process of working with them later. It's kind of the, the same thing as reducing fractions. Yeah. So like essentially, what can we reduce everything by to make these nice simpler numbers? Lily? Divide everything by 100. Divide everything by 100. <laughs> 
because then I get 9x minus 2 equals 6. I always tell you guys, the smaller the numbers, the closer are to simple whole numbers, the easier the math's going to be, and the less likely you are to make a simple calculation and mistake. Yes? So the x got changed with 9. This, this was saying we had 900 x's. So now if we divide that number <laughs> by 100, now we only have 9 x's. Well, let's try it out. Let's, let's try it. So let's see if the answer is going to be the same. So I would need to add 200, add 200, so I get a 800 equals 900x. Then so I take that 800, divide it by 900, and you can reduce that to 8 over 9. So let's see if it's the same thing. Plus 2, plus 2. 8 equals 9x, so x equals 8 over 9. So it's essentially just reducing early on than later. Okay. I don't know if you have to do something to get it back. No, we don't, actually. So that's why I like essentially reducing early on, because then we don't have to do it at the end. <laughs> All right. Um... Yeah, how do we feel as far as manipulating equations? So it doesn't always have to be multiplying by tens, hundreds, stuff like that. You can manipulate, you can multiply everything by four. You can, you can multiply everything by negative just to change the signs. There's a lot of things you can do. You can essentially just change them however you want. And this will actually come up too in our next lesson on solving equations or solving systems by elimination. So you'll see this in your next lesson. Dan? Um. Yes, this is being recorded right now. Um, the problem is that you only will probably hear me very well. You won't hear your own questions very well, um, which is why I'm trying to say all the questions back, but it's hard. But yes, this will be up and available. Evan. Um, so would that be a valid answer? Like, would you say this? Yes. Yes. Okay. Eight over nine is fine. Unless it specifically says in the instructions, leave as a decimal of two places or whatever, then you can change it. Jake. On um, other meetings, are, is this going to be what we do, or is there going to be other like, concepts? A lot more concepts. We'll okay. do co new concepts every time. So we're not done yet, actually. We need to keep going. We have two more things to do. And then you guys will take your quiz and go. <laughs> All right, we're going back to whatever, fourth, third grade, greatest common factor. <laughs> But you won't be able to use your notes on the actual placement test, though. But yes, you can use your notes on my quiz, as always. So in whenever third, fourth grade, you guys learned a definition of the greatest common factor. It's now going to be go taking a little bit further, and it's just whatever you can multiply out of all terms. So it may be a number, but it may also be variables as well. And you can kind of think of it as your undistributing. So distributing, it's like we multiplied everything by 3, and finding the greatest constant factor, we're taking back out that 3. So it's going backwards from distributing.
All right. Who can tell me what's the greatest common factor from 3x minus 3y? What could be undistributed here? What's the same in both terms? John? Three. The 3. So if I essentially wanted to <coughs> undistribute it out, factor back out the common factor, I can turn this into 3 with x minus y. Okay? So like I said, it's undistributing. You're going backwards from distributing. You're taking out what was distributed, what's common by everything. Yeah, I mean, if so, actually, if you wanted to, instead of saying there's a three that's common, if you want instead want to take out a negative three, you could. It would just change the sign. So if I took out a negative three from positive three x, you'd be left with a negative x. You'd have a positive y. So technically, you could go either way. That's actually a really good question. So it might actually depend on what you're going for if you want x to be positive or negative. So you can change it. Math really is about just manipulating how you want numbers to appear, which is probably why I like it. All right, let's try one more. If I have 20xy minus 4x, anything the same between them? Vincent, what do you see? There's a 4 the same between them, right? Because I can take a 4 out of 20. So if I take a 4 out of 20, I have 5 x, y, minus x. Is that fully undistributed? Is there anything else I can take out? Dan? Okay. Joey, what else can I take out? You can also take out the x, so you get 4x on the outside, and then in parentheses, 5y minus 4 Okay. So you can see, you can do it in a couple steps. Some of you might have seen 4x right away, and it's okay if you go step by step. So first take out the 4, see what you got left. Then you're like, oh, there's also an x left. Take that out. Wait, where is the 1 from? Because if I take out an x, there's still a 1 left over. So you can think of I'm dividing everything by x. Yeah. And if you're unsure... If I'm not really sure that this is right, distribute it back out. So let's check it. Let, let's distribute it back out. 4 times 5, that would be a 20 with xy. 4x times 1, 4x. Oh, so did, did we do it right? Yeah. So if you're not sure you factored it correctly, multiply it back out. See if you did it correctly. Yes, fractions. You can turn them into decimals, sure. If that helps. I'm actually better at fractions than I am at decimals. 
So what's common? What can we take out? Isaac? One fourth. I can take out one fourth. So if I take out a fourth, if I have a half and I take away a fourth, how much do I have left? A fourth. Is that right? Oh, I have to make it two. Does that seem right? Because if I do one fourth times two, am I going to get to a half? Okay. So always recheck yourself. So, we essentially are dividing everything by a fourth. Yeah. Yeah, because what we're doing is we're, we're going through and we're essentially just dividing everything by one fourth to pull it out. I saw it as one half as two fourths. One half as two fourths, so you have two left over. Okay. Now, if we, if you did change it to frac, or sorry, to decimals, what are we taking out? Point two five. Point two five. I personally think the fraction seems a little bit easier with this sort of stuff, but you are welcome to do it with decimals. And these are definitely ones because they're a little bit weirder. You're going to want to redistribute to check yourself to make sure you did it right. Exactly. That's how we know we did it right because if I redistribute it, that's 2 over 4x, which is 1 half plus 1 fourth. So we did it right. All right. You guys ready to see how this is actually going to be used? Sure. Dan? So we just replaced the 0.25 with a 1. When we replaced the 1. When we undistributed it, yeah. Because when we distribute it back out, that's going to replace that. So you're essentially saying, you're, pull, you're saying how many 0.25s are in this, and there's one in this one, and there's two here. So that's why you have your two and your one. All right. So I'm going to show you how undistributing, how factoring out first before solving can actually be a little bit nicer. Because we all kind of freak out when we see fractions. So is there something we can undistribute from this side? Is there something similar in both these terms that we can undistribute from the left side? Ian? Uh, one third. One third. We can undistribute that one third. So we have a y minus 1 equals 1. Because most of the time when we try to solve these, when they're looking like this, we're going to want to distribute. But here's the secret. You don't have to. You don't always have to distribute. You can get rid of it first. What is the one-third doing to all the parentheses stuff? What, what operation? Multiplying, dividing, what is it doing? Jack? It's multiplying. So how do we undo multiplication? Division. Division. How do we divide fractions? Multiply. Flip it and multiply. Multiply it by the reciprocal. So we're going to multiply both sides by 3 over 1. So those just go away. So we end up with a y minus 1 equals 3. So 
Yeah. Yeah. If you you can put a one in front of y if you want to. It's the same thing. Dan? Um, so Yes. So because one third is multiplying, we have to divide it by a third. But you don't divide fractions the normal way. You instead multiply by its reciprocal. Oh, okay. So that's how we got times in multiplying by three over one. Okay. Okay. So you can see we got to a much simpler problem than if we had done it the original way. So let's take a look at the original way so we can kind of appreciate what we just did. So normally we would have been at here. How would I get rid of subtracting one third? Joey? We have to add one third. So you have one third y equals one and a third, which none of us like. And then you're like, okay, well, I would need to change that to a mixed number. So I much rather be solving this than this. Okay. So if you have something you can undistribute and then get rid of by dividing, it's much easier. Yes, Evan. You can always turn things into decimals. But again, one third, that's not going to be a good decimal. That's 0 0.33333333333. So turning them into decimals is not always going to be helpful. Jack? Yes. We still have one more thing to go through. All right. Oh, my poor board. Okay. We're not done yet. So we're going back to least common multiples. number that can be evenly divided by a set of numbers. So this is what you used in like fourth grade when you were trying to find common denominators. This was what helped you make sure that you chose a number that was small so that it didn't make everything really tough. So this will help you as far as um, multiplying equations in order to change them. So you need to know what the lowest common multiple is so that you don't make all the numbers too big, essentially. So. So if I'm trying to find the lowest common multiple, which we can rewrite as LCM, of 6 and 4. No, what number do they both go into? So we're trying to find the number that they both go into. 12. Riley? 12. 12. They both, the lowest common multiple is 12. Now, a lot of you will know, well, they, it also goes into 24. But if we're multiplying numbers, we want to multiply things by the smallest number possible. So yeah, we could be using 24, but it'll make things easier if I can use 12. So what if I want, let's do 3, 7, and 2. I want the lowest common multiple of 3, 7, and 2. The way I like to do it is just make lists of their multiples. So I can start with 3, 7, 2. And just go through, it's like, well, we have 3, 6, 9, 12, 
15 and on and on. So it's like we have 7, 14, 21, 2, 4, 6. And then see where they line up first. Go ahead and try that one. Three doesn't go into twenty-eight. It's forty-two. Forty-two. Is that the lowest one? Forty-two. Okay. Okay. Let's try one more. Forty-two. I knew that. And. Nine, six, and five. Nine, six, and five. Find the LCM. It has to be a number that has a zero and a five. Does it? It does. Yeah. Oh. So it be, Do we all agree it's 90? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> all right. <laughs> all right. I'm going to, yeah. Yeah, we need, to, we need to start your quiz. All right. The quiz has five questions. Covers pretty much everything we just went over. You are welcome to use your notes. Please share. Please no talking during it so everyone can focus when you're done. Dan, when you're done, bring it up and then you are welcome to leave. Okay, so you can leave when you are done. <coughs>